Hello, and welcome to the first session of Morrison and Forrester's 2022 Life Sciences Mo Forum, Growth, Innovation, and Strategy. I'm Bethany Hills, partner and co-head of MOFO's FDA and regulatory compliance practice. Our cross-disciplinary life science team advises innovators and investors across the globe at every phase of their growth cycle. And we are extremely excited to present this program focusing on the critical issues that are driving the rapid pace of innovation and investment in the industry. I wanna thank all of our speakers and my colleagues in advance for their thoughtful discussion over the next three days and we hope you find this information valuable to take back to your teams. I would also like to, to take this time to thank our sponsor, Nucleate. If you haven't heard of Nucleate, you should have. It's a collaborative nonprofit organization led by academic trainees dedicated to empowering future biotech leaders. It had success at Harvard University and MIT, and now Nucleate has evolved into a national organization with chapters across the United States. Before I introduce today's panel, I wanna give a quick overview of our program for the next three days. We're going to cover a wide range of topics focused on business, legal, and regulatory trends, of course, regulatory. Our diverse program moderated by members of MoFo's life science team is going to feature some of the leading life science innovators who are going to discuss key strategies shaping the industry. Today, our focus is digital health transformation in life sciences and the challenges and opportunities in digital health and what they will bring to the global market. Tomorrow, we're going to feature an in-depth discussion on the future of drug discovery and diagnostics and the new technologies that are fueling exceptional growth in this area. And finally, on Thursday, our program concludes with a fireside chat featuring Shannon Klinger, Chief Legal Officer of Moderna who's going to share her unique perspective on the industry's response to the pandemic and her outlook on the future. To get us started, I'm gonna hand things off to Bridget Bondak of Council and a member of our regulatory and compliance practice, who's going to be moderating today's digital transformation in the life sciences. Bridget, over to you. Thank you, Bethany. And welcome everyone to today's 2022 Life Sciences Mo Forum session on the digital transformation in the life sciences. Before we begin, I wanted to go over a few general webinar housekeeping reminders. First, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to ask any questions for our panelists. We will be monitoring this throughout the session and we will answer them as time allows. Second, if you experience any technical difficulties, please send us a note in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen or email Nora Moore at nmore at mofo.com. We have a dynamic panel lined up for you today, featuring innovators from across the digital health sector. First, we have Melinda Decker, who is a global biopharmaceutical and digital health leader with a mix of commercial and R&D expertise. She currently serves as an advisor to several companies focused on digital health, as well as to MIT's health science and technology program. And she previously held leadership roles at both AstraZeneca and Pfizer. And most recently, she was the chief commercial officer at Miami, a leading digital health company focused on autoimmune disease. Next, we have Chris Bergstrom, president of Amalgam RX. Chris has been on the forefront of digital health for more than a decade, recently serving as partner and head of digital therapy at Boston Consulting Group, where he helped the world's leading life sciences companies design digital health tech strategy. Prior to BCG, Chris was chief commercial officer at WellDoc, where he launched the, wor the world's first digital therapy. And rounding out our panel are Shaheen Lachan, chief medical officer and click therapeutics of, of excuse me, and Laura Tarabanta, senior manager and head of clinical innovations at click therapeutics. Shaheen is a physis physician scientist with over 15 years of experience in healthcare, academic and industry, focusing on neuroscience research and development. She is board certified in both neurology and pain medicine with clinical training from Cleveland Clinic and Massachusetts General Hospital. As an expert in patient empowering clinical development from drugs to devices, Dr. Locken is keen on transforming medicine and democratizing healthcare through digital therapeutics. Laura is an innovative business professional with a demonstrated history in healthcare and clinical trials. She is passionate about merging digital solutions into current business models to alleviate the demands within the healthcare and life sciences industries. And we are excited to welcome everyone here today. So let's get started. First, I think we should probably put some limits on the term digital health for the purposes of this session because it can be an extreme, exceedingly broad topic. 
Today, we're focused on healthcare. So when we say digital health, we mean digital tools that help patients and providers. Now that we have our working definition of digital health established, let's hear from our speakers about what the digital transformation has looked like for them and their companies over the last few years. Chris, you've been in digital health pretty much since its inception. What can you tell us about your journey specifically over the last few years? Well, it's been nothing but a rocket ride, right? Meaning uh, in the true essence of it, everything's been accelerating. It's been rough. It's been fun. No matter where you are in that journey, you're hitting challenges as an industry, as an individual, as a company, and you retire those and then more come along. You know, if you like to be on kind of the pioneering front, that that's what the fun's all about. But, uh, you know, when I think about my time at BCG, or I was advising a lot of the, the world C-suites in the healthcare, when I walked into their office initially in 2015, they would say, well, why is this digital health guy in the room? And then 2016, they would say, well, I, I know he, need, he and his team need to be here. I'm just not really sure why. And then in 2017, hey, I've assigned a vice president. They have a small budget. Can you work with them on whatever it is we should be doing? 2018, hey, now they have a whole team put together. We still don't know what they need to do, but, but you know, let's really try and sort that out. 2019, hey, we've done some pilots. 2020, those pilots didn't go very well. I can't believe that. 2021, now let's rethink how should we be partnering? And so, and, and everyone has to go through their own personal journey, whether you're a CEO or a company. And, and so I, I think it's it's good for the industry that we've kind of gone through everyone's experience, some sort of hitting their head on a wall. And, and it, it really humbles everyone and causes everyone to pause and say, you know, what, what am I good at? What are other people good at? And maybe kind of the final comment, Back in, I think it was 2016, you can YouTube it, I gave a talk at CES, and, and my theme was, look, the last five years was about inventing digital health. Uh, the next five, the current five years at the time was about showing there's a reason to believe it works, so it's like proof of evidence. Uh, and then the next five years, which starts 2022, coincidentally, is this is where we begin to scale. I remember saying that, I'm like, no one's gonna wanna hear that we're five years away from beginning to scale. And I probably could even make the case that we're still five years away from really scaling. But, but uh, yeah, I think that's where we are in the journey and, and um, you know, kind of my firsthand experience. Shaheen and Laura, can you tell us about the changes you've seen through the lens of Click Therapeutics? Um, maybe we can start with uh, Shaheen and then Laura. Oh, sure. Yes. No, thank you, Bridget, uh, for, for the kind introduction as well and, and fellow panelists. Uh, yeah, digital transformation. No, it's, it's a scary term, right? Um, <laughs> it's a scary term that we all have underwent uh, in organizations that we've been part of. It looks like, Chris, you know, we've consulted and guided others uh, in doing that. And for me, it's not been just a, ro a rocket. You know, rocket has kind of one trajectory and it's been a roller coaster because I've, I've, I've had folks where digital transformation is a checkbox. I mean, what is it? We got to do it uh, type of situation. Okay, now we're digitally transformed. Are we any more productive, more efficacious? Is our bottom line, you know, any different, right? Like uh, these are the types of things. So it wasn't a metric driven type of digital transformation, something you had to do. Then I saw the evolution. Actually, okay, there are some markers that I should follow. I should treat this like any other introduction as a service line, you know, in our organization to bring it on. Now, being on this side of the coin, so at Click Therapeutics, we obviously developed solutions, right? So digital uh, therapeutics that, that treat diseases. So it's not just a digital health, uh, you know, monicum, it's actually uh, therapeutically efficacious and, and safe and tolerable type of solutions. It's, it's inherent, right, in our DNA. You know, I would say we're primarily like a tech-driven organization then that has regulatory controls with the FDA and, and send HHS, um, and then has uh, physician scientists largely, you know, under my team in the medical office. Uh, it's, it's part and parcel of our DNA. However, you could already tell, based on all of those um, stakeholders I've discussed, each one is running at a different pace. Uh, you know, tech forward folks, you know, generally are not used to regulated environments when they're in consumer centric entertainment type of organizations and Facebooks and uh, Googles and, you know, that are out there. Uh, on the flip side, clinical development specialists are highly used to in life science industry uh, to be in that. So, so how do you merge, you know, kind of the two people could say competing forces, actually would say they're complementary. And so it's been more of a cultural change agent than really process change or bringing in and vetting new technologies. Yeah, Laura. 
Yeah, no, absolutely. And to play off sort of the nuances Shaheen mentioned, you know, we've seen this whole, you know, we use this token word of digital th transformation, but we've also seen an evolution of people being able to adopt and have digital skill acquisition over time and get a better understanding and education around what digital tools uh, can do for you. And, you know, part of the whole value driven message is all these nuances within digital health, whether you're a telehealth provider or you are software as a medical device or you're in consumer wearables or, or um, such, um, we're all driving to create solutions that are able to be in the hands of patients, elevate the demands that we see in the clinical setting, meet the unmet needs that we've seen that created within our health ecosystems, right? Um, and so that takes a, a long time for adoption. It's not a steady <laughs> increase over time. And, you know, I think with uh, the past two to three years, we've seen more adoption, more understanding and education around the digital space, having the key players come together from the agencies, uh, pharmaceutical companies, opening up the doors and having a conversation with us to understand some of our processes mimic that of traditional drug development. However, here are some differences within our processes where we can actually leverage opportunities um, and create and get solutions out to market faster. So I think, uh, you know, now we're at a point where really the next uh, few years is generating that demand and looking to continue the momentum and have that adoption and scaling up. Thanks, Laura, and thanks, Shaheen and Chris. Melinda, you advise several companies across this space. What are some of the trends that you've seen, successes, challenges? What can you tell us? So, so a whole bunch of trends. Um, I think some of it is in the comment about scaling and really learning from that. Um, some of it is about adoption and reimbursement. Some of the things, for example, we're looking at here, um, Click has both prescription and non-prescription uh, digital therapeutics. Um, and so how are those getting rolled out? Are they working with self-insured employers? Are they working with payers? I think actually one of the interesting pieces in uh, digital health is also um, is also the clinical trial space. There's some really innovative work happening in novel endpoints, digital biomarkers, you know, decentralized clinical trials, things like that, and that is where you know also tremendous opportunity lies to speed up clinical trials, to get treatments to the right people sooner, to find the right kind of personalized healthcare. So there's a lot of trends in that way. And actually the clinical trial space has some opportunities that maybe have less challenges than commercializing and getting reimbursed because pharma simply pays for it. And the value um, makes sense if you can speed up a clinical trial by a month on a blockbuster product, it's worth hundreds of millions um, of dollars, if not a billion dollars for just that month. Um, and so a lot of those insights and a lot of the endpoints um, and some of the work being done in that space is really cool. So I love supporting both on the commercial side and the R&D side, because there's so much opportunity to include this technology and to get better outcomes for patients, which is, I know what so many of us are focused on. Thanks, Melinda. Um, how, let's talk about partnerships in the digital health space and best practices. Um, what are some of the best practices you've seen for digital health partners coming together and working together? Um, some of the questions I'd like to kind of touch on um, with each of you uh, is, it, how can you attract a good digital health partner, especially if you're a smaller company? Um, are there certain ways that you should frame your, your value proposition? And are there partnerships with non-pharma entities like payers or disease-focused research organizations that make sense? Um, and then what are some of the terms that you should establish for a good relationship and keeping your partner engaged? And Melinda, can we maybe work start with you and then we'll work our way back through the opposite direction? Yeah, so the biggest thing that I would say is keep the interest of the other people in mind. The general kind of whiff them for each party is so critical. So if we say things that small companies can do to prepare is mitigate your risk, get high trust certified, get all of your legal compliance stuff in line so that if you're partnering with someone bigger, they're prepared to work with you, right? So there's some things, make sure you have cash flow to execute on the partnerships. There's a lot of pieces in that place. Um, one of the things, you know, we look at a lot of the partnerships, it goes beyond pharma. It's a lot of payer partnerships. And this is, and I know Laura has worked in this space before too, a lot of what real world evidence, what kind of claims, because what matters again to each person, um, perhaps a payer wants to know how you're going to improve outcomes or save the money, 
right? Maybe uh, a pharma partner would want to know how you're going to speed up a clinical trial or how you're going to keep a patient more adherent to the medication, um, you know, and increase value that way. And so making sure you have whatever data you, you have possible. So sometimes it's doing pilots that maybe you don't make the most money to generate that data in order to then get the bigger partnerships where you can say, I was able to demonstrate X, you know, $10,000 of savings per person based on claims data. That will be the way to get some of those partnerships I found. Laura, would you like to comment on some of those questions as well? Yeah, absolutely. To Melinda's point, I think it's understanding sort of what are the key objectives? You know, you're all running towards so the certain uh, metric, the key objective that you're trying to hit and the process along the way is what you'll have to be able to inform and really give that transparency into understanding what do we need to do, whether that's understanding our clinical development pro uh, 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 process and understanding that, you know, in our, in our organization with software, you know, unlike pills, uh, our software speaks back to you. So we have all these nuanced opportunities that we can learn of our products in the real world situation. So when you go out there and speak with um, payers, and when you go out there and try to partner with research institutions, there are different opportunities that you can leverage with each stakeholder. And I think combining that vision, combining that integrative approach really bodes well for you know, the success of being able to generate a product and launch it to market. Um, Shaheen, do you want to touch a little bit more additional on the nuances of partnerships as well? Yeah, yeah. And I'm thinking about this question here because inherent in the, the question is this partner, right? And this partnership is not just a contractual partnership, right? You're actually dealing with each other on a very, hopefully on a very regular basis, right? Melinda is very communication centric. So uh, you're meeting with each other and, and, and it's hard in this in this pandemic environment to physically do that. But I, I think you, you before engaging in a partnership, you gotta like each other. You gotta mutually respect each other. Yeah, Melinda, we need to make sure that there's a financial viability for, for, for this partnership. Like, I, I think those are kind of like the three building blocks um, that I, I could discern from many failed and some successful partnerships. I'm, I'm, I'm fortunate to say that we, we have some at the click, some of the, the groundbreaking, record-breaking DTX pharmaceutical partnerships. Need, need us to say their name, they're multinational uh, corporations. And it, it was those three elements, uh, you know, that keeps it going all the way, you know, from discovery research to phased research to, uh, you know, phase three trials at the moment. Respect, and, when, and I can break down the respect a little bit more. It's, uh, you know, if you're the small player or health tech company, you're coming into these behemoths and you're telling them how to run trials uh, and they've been doing it for maybe more than a century, there's a problem there. There's a problem there, right? Like, but if you did an assessment, yes, they run many trials and they are, yes, efficient to some degree, but here are some areas uh, where there could be some improvements and uh, improvement could be on time, could be on money, hopefully both, uh, and robustness of data that comes out of it. I think that's fine. If you could show data, even in a handful of folks, that speaks much louder than this theoretical possibility. You know, I love use cases. I love my own use cases that I've been a part of, right? And so data that you've generated, and there's not been cherry picked too. I love talking about the failures. And I was like, these are the learnings. These are the insights that were generated. And this is why we pivoted or shift. And that's why we're actually approaching you. It was not like you were at the bottom of the pickings. It's actually, it was our voyage and our iterative process that led to you. And that's why this is a true partnership, yeah. And, and I, yeah. I think- I'm sorry, I was just laughing because I'm, I'm glad that Shaheen's not the only one who noticed that this sounded like a little bit like dating advice. So, yes. so please go ahead, Chris. <laughs> I was going to say, I, I think Laura was spot on. She said, well, you have to be clear first about your objective. And, and I would say the first objective has to be the business objective. And, you know, it's not, oh, what, what do we want to do in terms of a clinical objective or from, uh, you know, a, an impact on society or those can be your guiding principles but it has to come back to the business objective or it won't be sustained and then you won't be able to achieve the scale. And, and a lot of the partnerships I've been a part of, that's been a very difficult um, thing to pin down. And so I think we need more discipline and rigor about it. And you know, there's really th three different business objectives. Do you wanna drive completely new revenue streams? Do you wanna drive your core revenue stream or do you need some combination of both? And if you give the both answer, don't use that as a cop-out. It really needs to have a good justified reason because then you build your products and, and your roadmap and your evidence and your regulatory strategy all very differently based on 
uh, each of those. And, you know, another way to say it is kind of an around the pill term is appropriate for, you know, how do we drive our core revenue kind of beyond the pill is how do we drive, you know, completely new revenue combination products are oftentimes, you know, how do we work uh, in, across both of those things. And, and then you can set up those partnerships in different ways. You can do an investment partnership, which I would describe largely you're taking equity really to have a seat at the table to learn and be prepared to move more nimbly in the future. But it's mostly a wait and see. Um, you can say, I'm going to make it myself. Largely, we, we haven't seen that go too well with, with large companies, especially those that haven't worked in medical devices or software. I, I, I think it's probably too early for people to want to go down that path. Um, you can buy something, which could be great. You just have to make sure that, you know, it's probably a bit of a pricey transaction. So do you really believe that you've kind of set up and picked the right horse to bet on? And then there's the licensing model which I think as a lot of, especially the smaller companies have become more evolved over the last 10 years can be an excellent choice for large companies because they get the benefit, all, all that investment and they can come in and they can license some of that technology without having to buy the whole company. It's a much more nimble, agile approach. So I, you know, they're all viable. I think that's one of the ones that we're seeing more commonly. And then in terms of the focus of revenue, what I'm seeing and what I kind of predict to see is that we'll see more business objectives around around the pill. How do I drive my core revenue? Because we've tried things way outside of the business and it's just too far of a stretch for now for, for many people. You know, I, I give the example, we did pilots and it's a year later and they didn't work, right? So um, we, we need to have more belief in the investing cycle and, and you can kind of fund the journey, if you will, if you can grow your current revenues. Uh, at Amalgam, we really build ourselves as an enablement company. One of our products that we have is a distribution platform across all the leading EMRs. So we license our technology to the top payers, providers, life sciences companies, even other digital health companies. And then we use the data and the record to identify the right patients for the right products and services and then allow those to be matched up in real time in the workflow. So payers are using it to close quality gaps, again, core to their business. Providers are using it to enable their value-based contracts and recruit patients more efficiently for clinical trials. Again, top bottom line of their core business, but this is digital leveraging, you know, um, life sciences are distributing digital therapies through the EHR and companion with drugs and integrating into their core, their hub services, their patient support programs. So I, I think that's a bit of where we're just starting to, to lean into. And I think it's gonna deliver a stronger foundation for growth. Thanks, Chris. Um, those are great tips for becoming part of the digital health transformation. And you know, we, we talked about establishing the good relationship, but how do you how do you keep the momentum going, not only with the, you know, the partnerships that you have now, but just sort of bringing in again, more revenue. Um, can we talk a little bit about, you know, reimbursement and access? Is that just a necessary condition, but not sufficient? Melinda, can you maybe start us in on that? Yeah, it's, it's interesting because I'm a firm believer that that providing reimbursement and access is the way to actually disseminate to consumers broadly, right? I think there are some nuanced areas where people, consumers will choose to pay for it, things that are in conditions that are either low cost enough or there is high motivation, for example, weight loss. Many people are very driven to, to spend money on weight loss. We see some great success with Noom in a consumer model, but for most medical conditions, the path to get people to uh, be willing and able to pay for this treatment is having it reimbursed. So whether or not that's through, for example, self-insured employers as programmatic spend, or whether it's through truly being reimbursed by a payer, which I know uh, a lot of the, for example, prescription digital therapeutics are going for, but that really is the path to get it out broadly. One of the things I always remind, and we have a lot of people on the phone uh, or on this call who are attorneys and pharma companies and lots of things who we oftentimes think about our friends. And I always challenge people to think about our, our users are maybe your Uber driver right? Who has an Android phone and what, how much do they make? And they're working extra and maybe, you know, reversals at the pharmacy are 50 to $75. So we actually need to get things in that price point. Um, and so I always frame that up that way to say, we, maybe people can't spend $350 a month, right? That's their rent. That's their car payment. That's their daycare for their child. And so access and reimbursement is the path for 
almost all of these conditions to make sure that we can get it to into the hands of people, not only in the US, but around the globe. And um, Chris, have you faced any challenges with access or reimbursement in, in your history with digital health technology? And, and can you say more about what might, what might um, help, help others overcome some of those challenges? Uh, definitely the answer would be yes. So when I, when I think back, it was December 10th, 2014, I think, that I signed the, what I think is the first digital therapy um, formulary contract with one of the top PBMs when I was at WellDoc. Here we are six years later. There's not a, despite what anyone reads in any you know, news article headline, there's not a well-established process, procedure, um, technology rails for large-scale reimbursement for digital therapy. There will be. Um, and we're all going through quite a journey there, slower, slower than we all want. Not shocking. I mean, you can even look at um, any new medical device, traditional category, like continuous glucose monitoring, an industry that's booming $6 billion in sales this year. If you go back just five years ago, they were on a 15-year journey to begin to get reimbursement. That's for a traditional medical device that truly impacted people's lives. So at an academic level, there's nothing surprising at an operational level. It, it was really disappointing when I was able to get more of these in the hands of people faster and, and get the investment behind them. We're seeing great strides, uh, as many people on the call know, in Europe, uh, with Germany leading the way with, with an actual kind of codified process and procedure for initial reimbursement. We're seeing other countries in Europe beginning to adopt that. Um, there's definitely lighthouses and use cases. But I, I think what, um, what I hear that's legitimate is that we don't have enough high quality evidence. I think we have enough evidence in the digital health space to justify that we should all stop questioning if it's going to help the world. But I would agree that we don't have enough substantial evidence to know which products to back and at what price point and what level. And then the other thing that's generally not talked about, but is, is just absolutely the reality and the truth is, that the commercial firepower has to be in place behind these products. When you think of what motivates a payer, at the end of the day, it's mostly what any other business is motivated by. What do my customers think? So if employers and if patients are telling and, uh, you know, payers that this is what we want, and they're not going to be telling them this is what we want if they're not aware of these. And, you know, even people that are dropping 50 million a year in SGNA to promote a digital therapy, that's nothing in the scheme of, you know, when a drug launches, there's about $200 million of SGNA in that first year. So, you know, we're there, there's a clear path to, to get all of this through, I think, but it's going to take more evidence, it's going to take more commercial firepower, or more intelligent ways of delivering it, such as what we're doing, you know, at, at Amalgam, uh, through the EHR to directly identify patients. Chris, I'll just jump in to say the, the little disclaimer on the SGNA is for similar priced pharma products, the SGNA is probably similar. It's the fact that pharma products have higher peak year sales forecasted, right? So if you're going to have a blockbuster product, you're going to spend a couple hundred million on television ads yet for, you know, to consumer drive. So not that there's a lot more being spent or different percentages. It's probably more similar, but for a product that might have peak year sales forecasted of say $250 million. Along those so lines. your your point spot on, and that's how they can. That's how they're able to fund that. But it, but be, but a smaller budget doesn't move the needle. Um, yeah. yeah. So that that's our conundrum, right? Do we have an investment case that allows us to spend that? So you know, the one place we are seeing that is in direct to consumer digital health. So Noom can spend three hundred million dollars a year to maybe break even and grow to a scaled business. We haven't quite established that in, in the kind of reimbursement space. And, and I would go back to this is, and I love the term fund the journey. I learned that at BCG from some other smart people, but, but um, if, if you can grow your core business while you're building the case for the reimbursement, then you can fund that journey that allows that to pay. Um, so I, I, again, that's why I see kind of the around the pill, grow your core business first being an um, increasing strategy across life sciences and other companies. I can jump in a little bit. I think to Chris's point earlier about um, the evidence generation, you know, there 
rightfully so, you know, that we haven't seen sufficient evidence packages, right, submitted for a lot of these solutions out there. And I think part of the unique capabilities of our space is that we're able to generate that in parallel as we get to market launch, right? There, there, there's no need, you know, the drug space has, uh, you know, a prescribed way that is well known uh, in terms of getting and generating uh, the data they need to be able to uh, approve the drugs and then get market adoption. But in a space where there's not so much new understanding yet or adopt, you know, adoption or demand from the providers, from the patients who aren't as aware of the potential that these solutions have, I think that's the next layer that we have to almost work towards before we even get to the formularies to generate that demand, to generate that understanding, build our evidence package around that to be able to convince uh, the users, uh, the providers, uh, the health ecosystems, so that by the time we get to the formularies, you know, we have this substantial data, we have the demand there to back us up, and we'll be able to get there, um, whatever that pathway might look like. Where in the future, you know, apps, you know, in our space, apps will be prescribed just like drugs with similar in indications, um, just as we like to, through our programs, target actual drug endpoints uh, and see the value of that without the, the you know, uh, a decreased safety profile. So I think there's a lot of nuances along the way before we get to the reimbursement pathway that I think, depending on which part of the in digital health industry you are, there's different challenges along the way and different metrics that you're held against uh, to be able to meet. Thanks, Laura. Shaheen, anything to add there? Uh, a, a lot of echoing the same, but let me see if I could add anything different here. Um, yeah, I used to actually sit on Virginia Medicaid's pharmacy and therapeutics uh, committee before I got conflicted. And so we managed around $8 billion of uh, formulary decision-making. And if I looked at some of the evidence dossiers for <laughs> solutions uh, that are being presented right now, they wouldn't make the cut. There's no reason to think that if we're trying to seek out a pharmaceutical reimbursement model, that uh, the evidence bar is any less. And when I talk about evidence, it's well beyond clinical evidence, right? So yeah, you have regulatory bear, you know, um, bars for evidence and you might, you know, achieve those. It's clinically efficacious for folks that, you know, you pay to use them in the clinical trial population, right? I, I think that's fine. It's well beyond that. It's the, it's the real world, F, you know, bridging the divide between efficacy, internal controls and effectiveness, real world patients out there, uh, health economics and outcomes research and all of that. You know, you probably hear this all the time. And, and the sad thing is we, we're uniquely, because we're inherently kind of safe solutions, can collect and generate this data well before drug assets, because drug assets have to wait for post-market authorizations and safety reviews and everything else, and post-marketing commitments even sometimes before they collect um, you know, mass, massive data in these, uh, in these realms. And there's a, been a, generally a lack of investment um, in, in robust real-world evidence generation campaigns and robust market shaping and we're talking about market shaping for for pdts dtx's digital health solutions period uh that agnostic of right the disease state awareness or then then the branded uh, market that needs to go on it's almost an afterthought until post lunch and then you realize why isn't there no market adoption uh it's uh, it doesn't baffle me at all you know just like chris uh yes there has been other uh, you know, sectors of medicine and categories of medicine that had this decade long type of period, but those were largely, yeah, they had to get their act together, get the evidence together. They had to educate providers and patients and the market landscape and they get it on board. You, you would think that we would learn uh, from, from this past experiences, but it's not that we don't know, it's, it's actually funding, right? Uh, and that's why it's actually leading back to what you were talking about before, respect, respect your partner. If their partner is scoping and detailing, let's say CNS, uh, you know, physicians out there and has uh, already a huge market access force and policy and public decision makers and all of those government regulatory affairs, exercise that. That's the beauty. Okay, you could be very nimble in developing your technological solutions. They could be great on creating that market um, demand, essentially an awareness uh, that's out there. I think that's, that's generally how we approach it. Yeah. Thanks Good. all. And, oh, sorry, go ahead, Chris. I was going to say, if you connect some of these dots, it, it's clear that funding is going to be very important to make commercial success. But then we all might say, well, I thought all this money was coming in from venture capital. I thought all the big companies were putting money into it. So, so why is there a lack in the funding? I, I think that we're probably now overspending on the pre-commercial phase of digital health. 
like, you know, again, five years ago, we needed money to build solutions to generate some basic governance. I think right now, the better approach, and I'll give you examples. So, so we've partnered with Novo Nordisk and we built a digital therapy and they license it from us. So they didn't have to go through the, and, and this could be true of people working with Click or many of the other companies, right? So they didn't have to go through funding this process and the multiple years of getting a, a product built, showing that it works, putting it through regulatory, we're cleared on four continents. Their entire focus can now be on deployment. And so, you know, we're gonna be in 15 countries on three continents by the end of this year. And, and it it's, I think that's the shift right now is, is really ask yourself when you're putting money into pre-commercial, did I have to do this? Was there not a better option, a better partner, something that I could license, maybe make a few tweaks to accomplish my business objective? One of the critical things that both Chris and Shaheen highlight on is find what you're good at and find out what your partner's good at and make sure, I mean, Pharma companies are machines at marketing and selling and market access and government affairs and policy and market shaping, right? Phenomenal, right? And I realize I came from pharma, so I'm totally biased in what I say, but there's really, really good things. There are other things pharma is less good at, right? Being nimble, innovating on the product side, you know, some of the product development UX stuff, that's not been our strength historically, right, in pharma. And so the examples you, you said there of there's a powerhouse market access team, rely on them. There's account managers who know all the payers, right? That's where these partnerships can be really successful. And even, you know, the public policy, and I know there's a lot of stuff with uh, Biogen and Adu going around on, maybe there was a little bit too much advocacy and government politics with that. But the good points of it were use your advocates, get your patient association groups ready, right? And I, I've said this before, and um, I'm always amazed that Reset O hasn't done better given all of the um, opioid epidemic, you know, all the moms who could be um, uh, activated, right? Those types of things, because it's all we hear about a lot of times. And that is a great public affairs policy PAGS type of solution that pharma would normally activate in that way um, to get that to say, it must be reimbursed because my son died. And this could have been prevented with that type of thing. And it's, it's, one of the beauties of, you know, how these organizations can market and commercialize assets. Yeah, that, that's a super important point. And oftentimes I'm, I'm telling companies like, like Pharma, you already know how to do a lot of this and you're very good at it. And for some reason, when we say the word digital, you think you have to rewrite the entire playbook. You know how to build advocacy support at the patient level, at the key opinion leader level. Um, you know, these are tactics that, you know, just think of this like another product. I think some of the hangups then tripped them up were, especially in pharma, who has very little experience historically with medical device regulations versus you know, drug regulations, that they got too involved in that and too many trip ups and it's too different to their processes and the MLR didn't know how to accommodate that. Uh, you know, there's definitely lighthouse examples of how pharma, you know, has now managed through some of that. But again, going to my point, move on beyond that. Rely on the companies like a Click or an Amalgam or a Pair or anyone else that knows how to do that and then use what you're very good at. Um, and then also there's still learnings. You know, so when we go country by country, we're still having to customize the product, right? You don't change the drug when you go from, from Denmark to, to India, but, but there is you know, global adaptation at the product level, culture, language, feature sets. And um, you know, so it's... But yeah, Melinda, you're you're spot on with your point. So I have a I have a question for for everyone, but um, maybe you can start us off. Um, one of the things that I know companies struggle with as a regulatory lawyer is this draw towards personalization or customization of the tool, mm -hmm. but then getting into a situation where you've got actually by the end of the personalization, you've got different products, um, and so you're you're taking what was originally one product through the regulatory process, you know, multiple times over in order to incorporate, you know, changes or modifications to the original model. How do you engage in that line drawing exercise of, you know, where, where do we, where do we sort of say, this is the, this is the kind of product that we can sell to, you know, enough people that we can actually you know, make it worth the, you know, the company's time and investment. Anybody have any thoughts on that? 
I'll jump, jump in just to say it's about segments, right? So for example, a lot of the behavior change related digital health solutions, what you're trying to do is figure out who's motivated by the carrot or by the stick and what particular aspects, right? Some of it's gamification, some of it's winning magical stars, right? You know, whatever it is to figure out what motivates people to do that. So it's not that each one is different. It's that there's different segments that, mm-hmm. that you can then group it into. As far as like the product lines and iterating, because that's also part of it, is that we're always learning and growing. So for example, a lot of us who work on SAMDs who use some of the, for example, um, technology that's in smartphones and tablets, as the operating systems improve, as there's additional things, we incorporate that. Like, why wouldn't we continue to get better as they incorporate that? So that is how you have to work with the FDA to say how much of a change now changes your product from the original product, right? And so now we've incorporated this gate aspect, right? Or we've incorporated some voice recognition or eye tracking or whatever features the new operating system, the coolest new iPhone, you know, and and tablets have. That's some of what you then have to negotiate is now it's substantially different. We need to do additional clinical trials. We're doing this as a new product. Um, that's the beauty actually, that's the beauty of this versus something like a drug that maybe iterates from, I worked on Enbrel, love the product that goes from a lyophilized powder to a pre-filled syringe to an auto injector that took a decade, right? To do that. Whereas that change could happen in a year or a year and a half in technology, right? So that's, to me, that's one of the fundamental differences. And to Melinda's point, so your intended use, right? That's where it all starts. What, what, is, what are you claiming? How do you intend it to be used? So a lot of thought needs to go into that in your regulatory strategy from the beginning so that you have whatever flexibility you think you need for as long as you can have. But, but there's nothing wrong with, you know, no one should be worried that, oh, I think we might want to evolve it and change the intended use, right? Then, okay, now we have to do a special. Now we have to do a, a full new filing. Um, or, you know, it's going to be a combo. And those are just part of your roadmap, your product roadmap, and you time them and you sequence them and you prioritize them. And, and, but also I, for, you know, quote personalization and that, that can mean a lot of different things, but, but I don't think this um, relabeling is needed very often, you know, so some of our products, you know, you can, you can be on drug A or drug B that's under the same label. Uh, it can you can have a titration algorithm for your drug that's you know titration A or titration B that's also under the same label. Uh, the content can be personalized and served up to you based on you know what's important to you, the symptoms you're experiencing or the medication you're on. But on the back end, there's a content engine where we're ingesting generally already approved MLR approved content, and then it all gets hashtagged and bite sized pieces out into the application. So, you know, I think when you design it that way, both on a technology and a content and a regulatory basis, you you have a much easier time delivering that personalization. Yeah, if I, if I could add, I, I think principally when I approach building therapeutics, um, you know, digital therapeutics, I always think of never build a solution in which the, the patient is a prisoner. Uh, you know, has a single journey. And so with that premise, you're creating different journeys to the same path, right? I mean, to the same outcome, I should say, to the same goal. And uh, provided, I mean, they're, they're safe, tolerable, and you have evidence behind that those journeys will take you there. That's the basis of a therapeutic alliance. You know, when, when you go to a physician, um, if, you know, let's say you came to me and, and I gave you a prescription, I gave you a lifestyle modification to do, and I told you how long to do it for, you know, why, why do you carry it out? Well, you have trust, you know, the license and so on, but we have a shared goal and I broke down that goal into steps. And if you take that steps, you believe that you're going to get to that goal. Essentially, that's how we build our solutions. And it's called the digital working alliance or therapeutic alliance. Uh, and provided, you know, in all our regulatory communications, we document that. You document, you know, what are the rail guards, you know, between and which you could operate, right? Um, if we have evidence of a dose response relationship, just like in clinical pharmacology and drugs, I'll show you it. There's a ceiling effect. Why deliver this content any higher, right? If they're um, and, uh, on the flip side as well. Uh, that, that's, you know, ultimately I use the tools from pharmaceutical development, apply them to digital therapeutics and package them to the FDA. Yes, it's the radiological health division, right? That does strictly right standalone type of divisions, but I mean, they, they, 
you know, they, they, they share a lot of the, you know, the, the same uh, content expertise. And sometimes you could ask someone from the other side to come and review your material. Um, the FDA has even issued guidances, right, on the use of AI in diagnostics and even in, in therapeutics. Now, naturally so, just because it's all pattern recognition, you'll see them on pathological imaging or radiological imaging and, and uh, assisting in diagnosis. And now it's moving more into now therapeutic realms and delivering um, either units uh, of therapeutic for a given period of time under strict you know, dose response relationships or true deep machine learning where I didn't give you the physiological basis of why parameter affects you know, your patient journey. So there's an evolution happening you know, right now uh, in the FDA in the review of these materials. Uh, we should push, you know, we should, we should be the ones that are trailblazing that, right? Not just following precedent and then keeping within those, those layers. Um, now, that being said, there's life cycle management. We can't develop, you know, the best and the best and best of solution. You're going to wait five years and by then you'll have 20 other uh, folks out there in the, in the market. And can you imagine getting um, any share of that? So plan it out, do version one that has the elemental therapeutic components to get to A to B, right? in your solutions while simultaneously work on your discovery engines of how now you can improve that, iterate them that. Once you have some real world patients, you can use that to improve the model. And then if you need to submit for additional filing, you submit that too. So I think it can all work even with its current system. Yet I know that's gonna to evolve to make this much more seamless, yeah. Laura? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think speaking to that flexibility, uh, you know, of being able to manage that personalization, but also sticking with what within the regulations itself. Um, I think that's the value add for, you know, software as medical devices here. And, you know, we're able to think ahead in terms of what is the next tech disruptor? What is the next biomarker? What is the next data point that we want to collect to be able to inform our treatment pathways, to be able to enhance the user's journey throughout therapeutic, increase engagement, or actually the impact, uh, the clinical outcome that uh, uh, providers are looking at. So I think you know that parallel between the discovery track, the actual product development, and the lifecycle management is a beautiful marriage in terms of being able to take the learnings from each stage and continue to iterate. And I think that the FDA is already having those open conversations and adjusting their guidelines and hearing and open to comments uh, from the industry to be able to start shaping um, and keeping pace almost with the technology itself. And, and I think we'll see that in the coming years, you know, we had the first to market, we'll have the fa um, fast followers, and then we'll see this established, uh, you know, new class of medicine uh, that is going to be a, a standard of care, a new standard of care for a lot of the different therapeutic areas. And it becomes a more a regular part of the conversation, not so much how to do it, but how to make it more. Um, so I, I think uh, we're right at that inflection point um, to be able to make those changes. Well, and just one comment, life cycle management came up as a comment here. And it's one of the things that if people historically have worked in pharma, that digital health is different because you're building your moat by staying ahead of everyone, always having a better user experience, always incorporating the better product, having better evidence to support because you had those features, because you had that piece. So it's very different in the mindset of, you know, yes, people have patents and yes, they have protected things. But the really big thing is if you always have the best product, it wins, which is why all of that is so different than how we think about pharma, where it takes, you know, years or decades to make some of the advances in formulations or some of those things. Here it's, there's just a new thing and you wanted to incorporate something from the operating system and you included it. Or there was this other data and Laura, you know, gave, there's a new endpoint you're collecting and there's some no, new personalization. And because of it, you always have the best product. And that is part, part, part of why, you know, and we can say it on regular tech. Why does iOS win versus, you know, BlackBerry, right? It was, it was just always staying ahead. And that's what I think a lot of the, you know, digital therapeutics and other digital health solutions are, are really building those moats by just swimming faster and incorporating and having the right people than, you know, some of the other um, solutions out there. One of the things- yeah, I, I, I'd I like to, oh, I just want to say, I'd like to say, Melinda, you know, you could certainly pirate my code, uh, but you can't pirate the models, the algorithms, the data that's informing it, the millions of patients' experiences and journey. That's the moat. 
That is 100%. And then unlike a pill, right? You don't care if it's blue, red, small, you know, maybe the size matters a little bit, but <laughs> it always does. And the, but there's, uh, this is an interactive solution. This is an interactive solution that folks are used to using apps that are engaging. So the user interface, right? The user experience. This is why I think engagement science is just as strong as clinical sciences to get you know people to use it and to get efficacy out of it, right? It's it's a multiple uh, of the two, and that's actually what I equate to the PKPD model of digital mm -hmm. therapeutics is that clinical sciences times um, engagements leading to effect. Yeah. Thanks so much, and um, Laura, I, I remember you mentioning something about. Um, pilotitis uh, during one of our earlier discussions and sort of recognizing when you don't need to wait to move ahead and run experiments on existing products or within existing customer relationships. Can you, can you help our audience understand a little bit uh, about how you recognize when you're at that point? Yeah, absolutely. I think this comes back to, I think what we discussed here and touched upon in various conversation is the uniqueness and opportunities within digital health. Uh, there's a new avenue for driving evidence, uh, running clinical trials, whether it's through its virtual or hybrid models, uh, whether we use a tool or whether you use an actual digital software as a therapeutic and try to understand uh, what are the outcomes and what the potential are. And in terms of the pilots, it's understanding that, you know, unlike a traditional pharma where you you go through your dose, dosing studies, you know, then you move on to your phase two, phase three, narrow in on the indications. Um, and then after post-market approval, can you really truly put it out in the world and understand the effectiveness and see if there's a match um, with a software? It's a unique opportunity that you're not constrained by that. You know, the safety profile for a lot, especially the different therapeutic areas that we target is pretty low. Um, and so you have the opportunities to play while you're running and developing your pivotal trials for the FDA approval to better understand sort of what are the patient populations within an ecosystem to run a, 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 a you know, leveraging uh, health systems who are, you know, wanting the tools, just are waiting for them and pilot, uh, uh, you know, a, a first version of your product or, um, a second version and while you start to understand how the user engages, how the provider engages with it, what types of integration needs are there that we need to adjust for in the clinical setting with the EHRs. Um, so I think that's what I mean by there's a lot of opportunities to go above the traditional how we think about clinical development, not that I'm saying respect the methodology behind that, but use it to leverage learnings along the way and get what you need, understand your subjects understand what clinically meaningful endpoints are. They might be different from what expectations are from the agency. How do you align those? Do you run a separate study? So I think that's where the opportunity is to be flexible in the way you develop um, both your you know, uh, product development, but also your clinical development to generate that evidence to support the launch. Um, and I think there's a lot of opportunities there with uh, institutional research, academic settings, uh, payer, pilots, uh, pharma as well, smaller biotech, other people that are doing different things in the digital health space. Say you have uh, companies working on digital measure, that would be a unique opportunity for you to partner with. That is another pilot opportunity to see how can you enhance your own product experience um, and they themselves can leverage and validate their tool in this new environment, in this new setting. Um, so that's, I think there's a lot of opportunities there for learnings, uh, not just a traditional route to generating, you know, your RCT double-blinded randomized uh, to your clinical endpoint. To your clinical endpoint. Before we move into the Q&A session, um, we, we do have a couple of audience questions. Anybody else want to add about um, into, you know, existing data sources and how you can, you know, take advantage of what currently exists or relationships that you're currently participating in that can be sort of the key to your next step? No? Okay. Um, so we have a question from uh, Amy Shannon, and she says, I agree that access and reimbursement is key, especially to achieve provider support. Given that deductibles continue to get higher and higher, even with the reimbursement, Will consumers continue to be the ultimate payers and thus most business models in some sense are consumer models? Chris, do you wanna take the, or Melinda, go ahead. Looks like you're ready to jump yeah, in. Yeah, so, uh, and hi, Amy. Um, so I would say what's interesting in that, so the deductible piece is different than what I would say like co-pays and co-insurance, right? So I think people will pay their deductible in order to get 
their level of coverage they want. And obviously on the exchange, there's some very low cost ones, right? There's different pieces that come there. But when it talks about copay and coinsurance, um, that really hits home to people. And part of it, I talk about um, uh, willing to pay for something, but also able to. I, I can't under underestimate the fact that, you know, we saw that people had um, in the US with the pandemic in 2020, people had three weeks cash on hand. So it's not a, a, a choice of like, are you choosing to spend your money on this? It's that you actually can't, right? We want to demonstrate value. So people differentially, for example, pay for things that impact them, like ADHD perhaps. They might pay for that because it's with their child. People might pay differentially for oncology, right? Because it's life changing, whereas they might not pay for diabetes or things that are asymptomatic, right? So we, there's a lot of elements that come into that on what people would pay for. Mental health, people might be more willing to pay for that, um, for example, and they, and they see the benefits. We know people pay out of pocket for counseling and therapy sessions a lot to see psychiatrists. Um, so I think there's a lot of elements. The fundamental thing is we need to have a good consumer experience. We need to have a good UX on everything. So regardless of who's paying, we need to have engaged consumers who want this, who are demanding it, who are part of this. So whether or not they pay, I, I would argue that once you get over hundreds of dollars a month for treatments, most treatments are not things people are able to defer money from, right? Um, and so that's just not even willing. It's just, are you able to pay? Um, and that's why I think some of that that benefit is here. Do other panelists, what are your what are your thoughts? I, I mean, I would generally agree, uh, Amy. The the opportunity for a direct to consumer pay will will continue to be there forever. It depends on the value proposition and the product offering. Um, to sound like a broken record, I, I think that the that the as big or bigger opportunity in the in the near term, five, 10 years, maybe forever, is to tap into the existing revenue sources. We spend, you know, I, what is it, eight trillion dollars globally now on, on healthcare, half of it in the US. And and so instead of trying to find you know new money to pump into there, how do we just tack on to the existing streams? And you know, you know for example, what is your value proposition? So one thing is uh, you know, can you use digital to help bridge the silos between payers, providers, life sciences companies in ways that haven't been done before to benefit patients? And does that unlock value that you can tap into revenue that's already there? You know, we're helping providers and payers work together to improve quality. We're helping pharma and providers come together to identify patients to be in trials further, faster, to uh, embed AI algorithms that can find, you know, people that have a rare disease that don't know it, that might, you know, be, uh, you know, coming up on, uh, you know, a pretty bad event if they're not found soon, helping pharma and payers, uh, you know, drive formulary pull through and prior authorization experience, which improves the lives for the doctor and the patient and the provider and the payer, if you get that right. And I, I just think latching on to some of those things that are tightly coupled to existing revenue streams, then that gives you the kind of um, luxury to pursue other models. But every single model is possible. It depends on the target and the value proposition. Thank you, Chris. Um, we have a couple of more questions, um, but I don't know if we're gonna have time for them today. Um, regarding clinical research and some of the FDA requirements. So I'm gonna send an email off to those folks and um, we'll try to follow up with you by email. Um, but I wanted to uh, thank our panelists today. Thank you so much for your excellent contributions. And I know everybody out there has really enjoyed it, especially with a lively Q and A that we had here sort of towards the end. And um, just wanted to remind everyone to uh, please join us for tomorrow's panel, the future of drug discovery and diagnostics, which will be moderated by Matt Carlin. Uh, same time, same place. Thanks again. Thank you, Bridget. Bye. Thank you, Bridget. Thank you, everyone. It's a pleasure. Thank you.